Well, it is arguably one of the most consequential political events in American history, and now the historical documents that help tell the story of what happened will be preserved for future generations. Talking about the infamous Box 13 case out of Jim Wells County, not Duval, Jim Wells. Our Mike Silva got a good look at those documents today for us. Mike? That's right, Joe. The results of Box 13 from the Senatorial Democratic primary runoff election race in August of 1948 between Lyndon Baines Johnson and Coke Robert Stevenson was the deciding factor in that election and arguably altered the course of history. As for the controversy surrounding those results, on September 3rd, some six days after the polls had closed, 202 additional ballots in Precinct 13 were discovered that had not yet been counted. Of those votes, 201 went for LBJ and one was for Stevenson. So I think it's very clear what happened in, in that box. And that is? That is, the box was stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Those 201 votes gave LBJ the victory over Stevenson, and the rest is history. The results made headlines nationwide as there were allegations of fraud and stuffing. A petition for injunction and temporary restraining order was quickly filed, but ultimately the results from Precinct 13 did stand, and LBJ remained the winner. And while the documents from the legal battle over the results are still around, the whereabouts of the infamous ballot box remain a mystery. That, my friends, is the minority vote. Damn. Oh, Jesus. What are we getting into here, Only? <laughs> that oh, was like Lord. an escalation there, almost. Escalation of violence. Oh, my <laughs> oh, Lord. Holy God. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I, I did my part. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the guy was wrong, but we'll get to it later. But it was 202 votes. Uh, two for Coke Stevenson, 200 for LBJ, and all 202 were originally Coke Stevenson's. They uh, went in and found the handwriting. They it just moved it over from uh, Coke Stevenson's uh, side. <laughs> well, uh, maybe maybe somebody will find the box that is yeah. still out oh, there. Oh, they'll find that box. Oh, sure. That that in uh, um, Geraldo going into a vault, uh, they'll find something. <laughs> Well, of course, that was one. Daniel Day Lewis in Gangs of New York, one of my favorite films of all time. The book, absolutely fantastic. Uh, eventually, took like ten years, twelve years to get the movie made. Wow, amazing, mm -hmm. amazing. So we've got, uh, let me see, six hundred and forty-four people in here. What? So nice, nice start, and um, that leads us okay. to today's okay. sponsor, and that's uh, all six hundred and fifty-nine of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please remember to tell a friend and subscribe. Seriously do. And if you like this and you're hanging out a while, likes are free. Just hit a like right now. Can you, ma can you imagine difference. if subscriptions were you had to pay for them? We'd have zero. We can't even get them for free, Only. <laughs> oh, it's like the strangest people. thing I've ever seen. I mean, no. it's no money to subscribe. Am I crazy? Or does it what does it cost money or something? Electricity? What's the yeah. deal? I don't know. I don't know. And and then YouTube had to change the color of the button. So maybe that's part of the problem. It used to be a red square care. now or a rectangle. Now it's a a black pill, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the button, it literally looks like a black pill. It used to be a red square. Originally I started out with Red Fox, but his comedy was too controversial. So they maybe, there. maybe that's it. Oh, Marco, um Etienne de Gaulle is going to New York City next week. Any restaurant recommendations? I, I don't know what still survived. I mean, um, I have no idea what survived COVID. I haven't been there in two years. So um, all I could yeah. say is if there's H&H &H bagels anywhere, get there. Um, and because they have all kinds of stuff you can get at H&H &H bagels and you could do what you want with them. Cool. All right. So to the subject of the day, because we definitely... Um, well, you know what? This is a beautiful red wave. I like red super chats. Right. <laughs> They're amazing. Thank you very much, Turkina. Oh, Mark. I'm wearing my uh, tie, my political tie for the first time. This one here. Never. I love that. Before. Love that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought I took this out. I've never won. I've had it for years. Um, my one political tie. Awesome. It makes. Uh, I'm. I'm pretty happy with my thumbnail too. I thought that. Yeah, well, you're happy cool. with a lot of your own work. I'm happy with That's my right. election buttons that I took out my two of my collection today. Um, one of them all the way with LBJ, and the other one uh, Democrats for Nixon, which we're going to get to later in the show. Uh, explaining both, actually, we'll get to both of these. Right. You, uh, before we came on, you you said that you even have international, which aren't relevant to here, but. Um, oh, yeah, I've got the stuff of Stalin and Lenin uh, from the 20s and 30s buttons that um, I've collected for years and years. Um, even some of Mao. I've got original Mao buttons, but the ones that the, the Stalin and Lenin buttons are on like some dungaree jacket I was wearing. And I went over to Glendale one night and I got attacked by a bunch of Armenians, not knowing for what reason. And it was the they were yelling at me about Stalin and Lenin. I don't know what they're talking about as they're pulverizing me. So uh, oh. note to self, remove buttons. Um, yeah. vet, vet, vet merchandise before you wear it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it had been on in my jackets for years. You know what I mean? It's just a goof. I didn't really think about it. You know, as are a lot of these political buttons are on my jackets, you know, some of them the reverse of my own ideology, but it's kind of a joke, you know. Awesome. And somebody asked about Rumble. I just looked uh, 106 watching on Rumble too. Wow. Wow. That's kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. So that might well, be let's just get into today and then we could go back in time. Um, what What is going on? Do you have any reports coming across the transom or anything? Does uh, anybody know what's going on? Does anybody in the chat know what's going on? Does anybody have any feedback? Just because it's election day, I thought we'd have updates during the show if anything happens. You know, if somebody's a sure. You know, I, the last time in 1968 here in L.A., the guy running for Senate had uh, was shot in the head. So we things do happen on election day here. So that's why I thought we'd have kind of a live show with any kind of breaking news being brought in. Because sounds good. Uh, I know that. Um... Um, about him being shot Franken, Franken candidate apparently is already suing in Pennsylvania, but oh, the humpback, yeah, <laughs> hunchback of Notre Dame, yeah, yeah. Apparently, he's already suing and demanding uh, counts uh, for, I guess, people who don't fill out ballots correctly. I, I don't know what what's going on with that here. I I only had one candidate um, to vote for on the national level, one congressperson. No senator is up. So it was only my district and then like city council. Oh, weird. My was ballot it. was about 22 pages long. It had all kinds of constitutional amendments, ballot amendments. Uh, California. Judges. Um, you, you have to go to these guys who know, uh, like there's different websites where people go through it who are politically like you and make the picks for you. And if you adhere to them, um, John Phillips on ABC here in L.A., um, is a great source. He does a whole ballot pick. You know, it's kind of like your picks for the uh, March Madness or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, brackets. <laughs> brackets. No, yeah, yeah. Well, I, like I said to you, there were f there was about twelve judgeships, and embedded in the twelve somewhere secretly were four George Soros candidates, and he'd never done judges before. So this guy Phillips outed them, and then everybody passed it along as to who, who the four were. Uh, hmm. not, not to vote for. And if he didn't do that, because you look at these judges, you don't know anything about the judges. You yeah, know, how I mean? would you know? That's my city council, too. Right. And, and by the way, they're slick here. Um, uh, they're all 100 percent independent. Oh, wow. That's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's like they, they literally go in and there's an I next to every one of their names. 100 percent independent. Usually here with the judges, it'll say there'll be a tip. Former assistant DA, former public defender. <laughs> so you just go, oh, thanks. Okay, that makes it easier. Yeah, now it's like, yeah, I'll go for the DA. Thank yeah, you. but Ga that's how Gasson got in. Well, it could be Gasson. Yeah, it could be. Right, that he got in as a former DA. So that, yeah. that won't hunt anymore. But All right. well, I just want to get into some uh my predictions. And I'm not Rich Barris and I'm not Barnes. So I, I'm just going my gut. I don't have. Okay. I don't have the the machinery that that Barris has, but mm -hmm. like like some of the viewers know, my grandfather was the campaign manager for the mayor of New York. Election Day was like Christmas Day for us. I grew up in a political household, a Democratic machine household out of Brooklyn, uh, run by a guy named Mead Esposito. 
uh, that my grandfather was later a bag man for, and he was an accountant, you know, but we say bag man in the family, but he was an accountant for the Democratic Party. And he was a campaign manager in 1952. But that being said, I'm just going on my gut. And I'm predicting, again, like Barnes, a landslide in the House. And I think we will, the Republicans will retain the House for many, many years to come. That will be unremovable for a very long time because of the sheer numbers, uh, possibly 245, possibly 250, uh, according to Robert. But the, num the, the numbers will be large enough to sustain that majority for years, for years. Now, on the Senate side, I see a darker picture. And I think it's because of blue governors and uh, mail-in ballots. And I'm predicting steals in the following races. Uh, Laxalt in Nevada will be stolen. I believe Walker will be stolen after the runoff in Georgia. It'll go to a runoff in December. That'll be stolen like Warnock uh, did the last time. I think Ron Johnson will be stolen in Wisconsin. I believe Caruso here in LA, the mayor's race against uh, Karen Bass, the former Black Panther and avowed Marxist will be stolen. I believe Oz in Pennsylvania will definitely be stolen. And uh, I believe Mas think Oz will pull it out. No. And yeah, we're yellow already. Yeah, I think that Masters in Arizona uh, will be stolen. And unfortunately, I believe all of those will be stolen. I believe the how the Senate will end up with almost a three or four plus for the Dems. Oh, wow. Uh, that's my prediction. The House, it'll be massively Demo uh, uh, Republican. The, hmm. and, and I'll tell you something else. I believe that the uh, Department of Justice will weaponize their election uh, pursuit of imaginary fraud. I believe they will go after some congressional races and make physical arrests um, made up out of thin air. I believe that they will um, uh, be what, what the opposite of what Bill Barr should have been. They will do what Bill Barr didn't do. And they will go after imaginary, um, the very ominous statements yesterday about uh, voting machines and how they could be hacked by the uh, Department of Justice yesterday. And I thought that was very ominous. I also believe that all of this stuff about the end of democracy and uh, killing of the children and fascism coming was the Democratic version of dog whistles to their fanatic base to steal the elections with these absentee mail-in ballots like you're going to see in, in Pennsylvania. Then them talking about, obviously, the extension of the counting, how long it's going to take uh, when, you know, France had an election a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <it's>, yeah. <laughs> We're already yellow, so careful on the language, too. <laughs> so so France, France counted 36 million ballots in eight hours and gave their announcement by the, the same night as the election. This has to be stopped to get to the, the end of the story, this has to be stopped uh, one way or the other. Whoever gets into power has got to put an end to uh, the late counts. And I suggested last week on this show that one of the ways to do it is have the large urban areas report in first by law. Reverse the entire reporting process. Do not report anywhere else in any state before the urban centers report in and get it over with. Get their final counts so they cannot drag it out and they cannot cannot top the counts from upstate. And we're going to get into that with Box 13 with LBJ and the Democratic Party in Texas, which was a one party state at the time. But the way to end this madness is to end the late reporting from the Democratic uh, nerve centers or the urban nerve centers of each state. And that could be Memphis. It could be Nashville. It could be New Orleans. It, it's now spreading to where red states are having these problems out of St. Louis. And it's the same game plan. And unless we discuss this openly and clearly in an open forum, how to physically stop this, I am professing just one way. There may be other ways, but my gut tells me to just have the urban centers do not even count until you get their final count and base it legally on population centers saying the largest population centers mm. must support. Just a countdown. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you work in reverse. What's going on now by de facto, de facto, is they drag it out until the, the state is drained and then they top it. 
That's the game now. Everyone knows the game on both sides, but no one has offered legislation to change it. What I'm offering is a suggestion of a framework on how to end the madness, because this is not going to end, people. This is not going to end. This is a successful game plan they've come up with, and it goes all the way back to 1948, but now it's become so enormous as to be at state levels instead of congressional levels like it was or senatorial races in the case of Johnson in 1948. But this has been weaponized and it must be brought to an end if we're going to succeed as a democracy with voting. Otherwise, just forget it. How long are we going to play this game, Eric? I mean, how many if this doesn't work? I mean, as I've said for a year, this election right now today is going to determine whether we are a democracy or a complete banana republic. This one right here. And this one right here is now going to be determined in a week, in a week. So I think we're, we're starting to get a partial answer as to what we're up against. And what I'm suggesting is the House of Representatives, when we get in there on January 1st, has got to begin true election reform. It's the first thing you have to do to end this madness. And and I'm sorry, but this is what it's come down to. And, and, and you can't have the courts are not going to help us. They've shown that, Eric. Right. The courts are not going to. It's always latches or you don't have standing. Right. It's too early. It's too late. So all of this, uh, you know, these predictions that the Republicans have lawyers at various precincts. So does the Department of Justice. Apparently down in your Maricopa County, they've got DOJ people intimidating people down there. The reports came out of Maricopa this morning. So anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest before we started, because the, the, the <laughs> history of this thing, this is not the first time. The history of election fraud in the United States goes all the way back. I was telling Eric before the show, it's been scrubbed from the Internet because in, in 2020, they wanted only Trump to sound like election fraud was an aberration. Before 2020, there were tons and tons of articles on the web about the history, just the history of American election fraud. Those are all gone. I Luckily, I have books through the PayPal fund. I'm able to buy books and read books because if you do a search after this show, you're going to find very few examples of what I've been talking about today. Most of this stuff has been deleted and you will see only articles of, about, you know, calling Trump a nut for talking about election fraud. And if you saw the other articles going back historically, you would say, oh, well, there's a huge pattern of this in American history, which is what there is. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right. Now, Mark, I love you, man. You're a great friend and a great show partner. I wish you were wrong so much I know. right now. So I know. please be wrong. I know. Don't I'm take it as an insult. Eric, but Eric, nobody wrong. wishes I'm wrong more than me. <laughs> I mean, uh, this, I, this is just my gut saying this. This is not, this is, you know, look, I'm a half empty kind of glass kind of guy anyway. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I come from the dark side, Eric. So optimism and me don't really mix, you know, and, and this, the, the articles I've been reading in the past few days and my analysis and my gut and, and, and Barnes and Barris, I hope they're correct, uh, but they're looking at statistical numbers and those numbers are right. Those polling numbers are correct. But in the states where they control mail-in ballots with blue governors, I, I and somebody pointed out to me that it does them no good. By the way, I, I think that um, uh, Zeldin's going to beat Hochul in New York because it doesn't matter in New York. In other words, New York Nate was telling me. Nate, no, Nate was telling me that, that he was like, I think that Zeldin's going to win. Because right, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, a, it's such an overwhelmingly blue state that Zeldin's victory does not hamper the machine in New York. It's kind of like when we had Schwarzenegger in California uh, or Gray Davis or anybody else. It didn't alter the fabric of California because it's so blue. The same thing is true in New York. And it's not going to matter that much that Zeldin uh, is the governor. I think he will be. Uh, but the other places, Ron Johnson is going to be... Um, Ron Johnson is going to be stolen because they have to make an example of Ron Johnson. That one's personal. That one's personal. The others, I mean, are just political. And I think it's while it doesn't help them politically to control the Senate with a House they don't control, it is a message to the Republicans that they, this is a 2024 foreshadowing, Eric, is the point. And I'm not the only one to say that. 
What the it advice... does help them though, because every time the House writes a law, the Senate will just spank it down, and it, it you know it has a split right in there. Exactly. No, no, it does. It absolutely does. But he could veto it anyway, Eric. He can, but there could be enough in the House to pull it out. So I, I don't know. It, it's a right, right. But I think more of it is to show you what's going to happen in twenty twenty four. And it, if they don't stop this in, in the next two years, they will do it again in twenty twenty four. That's the point. And with all the ba- the uh, voting reforms that supposedly took place, didn't happen in Pennsylvania. Didn't happen in Wisconsin. Right. I mean, well, it, it, yeah, it doesn't happen in the uh, in the purple states, if you will. Right. And look at Arizona. I mean, uh, there's a woman named Katie Hobbs who still is the secretary of state running against Kerry Lake. And she was involved with the original steal out of Arizona as secretary of state. So it doesn't look good. Look, I hope Masters pulls it off. And I and I I I think J.D. Vance will pull it off. I don't think that's going to be stolen. Um, But the ones I mentioned, I believe, will be dragged out. And I think the Department of Justice will put their heavy hand on this scale, even if it means to physical arrests. Mark my words. Anyway, let's let's, let's go back. It. Let's go back in time to find out how the hell we ended up here. Okay. So, okay, pipe laying, thuggery, floaters, colonizers, paupers, prisoners, um, thugs. And um, what was another one? Rowdies. Okay. So they had this thing called cooping. And cooping meant um, this particular drawing, I think, is, is 1857, buying votes. Um, and it's showing two politicians with a, a guy. They would take you in in a thing called cooping. And cooping was a place where they were taken into a basement. And in the basement were all these uh, Democratic operatives. And I say Democratic operatives because that's who they were. And uh, mostly in urban centers, um, they would ply you with liquor. First, they would beat the living shit out of you, then ply you with liquor, then force you to go out and vote multiple times in multiple costumes, multiple outfits. So this here is an example of a guy who is being pre-cooped. And the cooping was to take you into a coop, like a chicken coop, down in the basement of a... Oh. Of a yeah, 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 yeah. I That's thought it could have been like Cooper is a barrel, like a barrel of No, beer. no, no, no. It was, they put you in a coop. And in that coop were all the Democratic political operatives who were gangs. Now, these gangs who ran the city really reported to different politicians. And you saw some... The reason I wanted Eric to show that clip from uh, Daniel J. Lewis and Gangs in New York, uh, where he's killing Monk Eastman, is because every politician in New York had a gang that was beholden to him. So the Hudson Dusters, the Dead Rabbits, the Bowery Boys, which, which was a real gang, these had thousands of members. And these thousands of members would turn out on election day to physically beat and separate the opposition from voting. They would go to the polling place and and beat the living crap out of anyone who was coming to vote for the opposition. And then they would also intercede to get their guys in to vote at the polling place. In the case of New York and the gangs of New York, which is the name of the of the movie and the book, all of these gangs uh, would fight each other um, on entire avenues. Just so you know where the gang war idea came from because we now think of the mafia having a gang war where nobody's visible. These gangs, a thousand on a thousand, would fight for days on entire city blocks in Manhattan. Try to imagine, and this, not just Manhattan. Yeah, this, this is one of the one of the, uh, the sketches from, um, at the election polls. I think that's 1857 from a magazine. But this went on Every single election, this is not an aberration, this is our ugly, ugly history, and if we go backwards in time even further to George Washington, I'm going to explain how we got here. So George Washington and and others, uh, in this case, Washington was running for the House of Burgess. Yeah, This is uh, in New York in the 1840s, contrast between the poor and the wealthy neighborhood. This um, is a very famous painting 
uh, by George uh, Bingham of 1846. But we're going to go back to okay. pre-colonial right. time right now. We'll come back to this. We're going to go back to George Washington. Time. He's running for the House of Burgess in Virginia. Um, and what you had to do back then um, was called treating. Treating meant, uh, this is hard to understand, treating meant you treated every single voter with unlimited alcohol for days on end to vote for you. Try to wrap your mind around that. Now, keep in mind, no, only people who could vote were landowners and not blacks, not women. Uh, so the, the amount of the vote was like 12% of the nation or something. But part of the ritual was unlimited alcohol by each candidate. And you had to drink with them and you had to get drunk with them because that showed that you had individual individuality where you could stand up like a man and be with your people who are voting for you. So in one election that uh, Washington had lost, they ran out of liquor and they went, the other candidate said, I've got tons of alcohol, boys. And they went over to the other side and drank for days with the other guy who drank with them and out liquored George Washington. That's how we started our election, people. <laughs> Think about that. That's the founding fathers. That's what they came up with. So the voting was completely public. It was considered unmanly to vote uh, uh, in secret. That didn't come for 100, you know, 100 years, Eric. You had to stand up and just say, I, Eric Hunley, vote for John McCain. And they went, what? You son of a bitch. Get him, boys. And the fighting <laughs> would begin, right? But that you had to fend it off. You had to be proud of your choice, Eric. And if you're drunk was, enough, it would be no problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, and, and it was no problem because you were shit-faced. So you voted for John McCain of 1755. And then the fighting. I ensued. like how you put that on me there. I, 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 know, I a great I choice know, here. I could, have pulled, I could have chosen anything. But the point of the matter is the other method of voting was in a town so they split the town physically. You came out into the street and half the town went to one side for one candidate and the other half went for the other side. And then you just identified, raised your name ver verbally and said, I, Joseph Johnson, vote for Hal McIntyre. Right. And the other was half, some of that due to literacy, too. And not yes, trying to a lot of it was due to literacy. Yeah, there were no ballots yet. There were no ballots. And but you keep in mind, the landowners are voting. These are the mm -hmm. wealthy people who are doing this. You True. know, once they got into balladry. That's a whole different level, my friend. That, the corruption does not start until they get into voting for the common man. Then it becomes a problem because now they've got to control it, which means they've got to control the common man, which means they have to use nefarious things. So every single election in American history has had tons and tons of fraud. Take that and smoke it in your pipe. That is part of the legacy of America's so-called perfect democracy. It is riddled with fraud up until two minutes ago. And I'm including the two minutes ago. <laughs> so the reality of Except it is... Except for the YouTube human moderator. We're saying right, everything yeah, is... Only, right. it's a, the, we, no, we finally had the perfect election right. that, um, in, in 2020, and it, and it continues now. It's, it's amazingly clean and pure. That's why they scrub the internet of election fraud. And that's why every article you're going to see is about 2020. And again, totally Orwellian. But there are things called books. And thank God that people on PayPal and Venmo send me money to get these expensive books. And I appreciate it because it's the only thing I can count on anymore. I can't just go to the web and believe this crap. You know, there was one article on the web. It was about the history of election fraud. And it starts out with Trump. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. It had one of those arty drawings we just showed. And I went, oh, here's one, 1850. Oh, no. <laughs> it was a sucker punch. So anyway, they get into ballots and they start coming up with election laws and they make the ballots different colors because of illiteracy, Eric. And, yeah. and that's that's when the ballots start to become uh, real. But they're not they're still public documents. So you had your colored ballot, yellow for the Whigs and whatever for the Democrats. Keep in mind, the Whigs eventually become, just to clarify who the Whigs are, um, we'll get to that in a second. But let's they get kind to, of became the Republicans. Over right. There. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. But let's get to Polk and Tilden. This is a great I'm not going to do that many presidential ones. This may be the only presidential one we'll do is 1844. Uh, that's James Polk. The Democrat and excuse me, 
that's James Polk. And then there's Tilden. Uh, Tilden was the Democrat. Polk was the was the governor of Tennessee, uh, who was a Democrat. And Tilden, I think, was the Whig. Let me see if I get this straight. Probably Polk, the Whig, yeah. If it's yeah before. Right, right. Because he becomes, I think he becomes a Republican a Republican later. Yeah, Lincoln, the Whigs became Republicans with Lincoln, if I recall, right? They, they kind of split Right, but Northern, Northern Whigs were, became Northern Republicans, and right. they were opposed to the Democratic South. So, yeah. So this is uh, uh, um, Tilden, who was uh, Samuel L. Tilden, who was the governor of New York, versus Polk, who was the governor of Tennessee. So this race ends in a a statistical tie, 2.7 million votes, but a lot of it is stolen. And um, they used all different kinds of methods in New York to steal this. And part of it was called uh, uh, piping, where they would bring in pipe layers and, and, and from out of state to lay pipe underneath the city, but they didn't lay any pipe. They were there to say we were working in the city so they could vote. And then they were kicked out the day after election day. They were called, uh, it was called pipe laying. They never did any pipe laying. And then they did, um, they took uh, illegal Ill aliens. And you think this is crazy. They brought in, uh, today, they brought in thousands and thousands of illegal aliens, like 5,000 a month. But they would naturalize them the same day, Eric, running 800 a day through corrupt judges' courtrooms, swearing naturalization to America in New York, in downtown, and then they could vote on Election Day. What they're doing now is for two years from now. What they did back in those days was for that election a month or two away. Same structure, same Democrats, same move. They did the same thing back then. They've just nationalized it and using bigger numbers right now. So, okay, so Polk, Polk and, and Inauguration Day was in March back then. So Polk and Tilden end up in a tie. So the entire country is ready for civil war. And in fact, in 1844, this is the first precursor to the civil war. This eventually leads to the civil war because there's people in the South who want the North to do their bidding and get off their back about slavery and other issues. And the, the North is, you know, doesn't want to do it. And Tilden eventually concedes, but it takes the longest time and there's fighting in the streets and there's literally uh, uh, resorts to violence. And the Whigs eventually become the, the, the Northern, um, Republicans, you know, like Lincoln also out of Illinois. But the first real corrupt race is Tilden versus Polk. And um, we got a President Polk. We didn't get a, Pol a President Tilden. All right. And who's next? Somebody's saying Clay. But OK, sorry. Yeah, well, he, he beat Clay. That's right. Polk beat Clay. That's right. And then... Um, Okay, so let's go to Bloody Kansas in 1856, because that's a good one. Bloody Kansas in 1856 is a free state, and um, the idea is that free states will be non-slave states. Well, they're not having it, so over 5,000 rough riders come out of Missouri and go into each town with guns drawn and demand to vote, town by town, and with the guns out. And they said, you can't vote here. You're from Missouri. And they said, like, hell, we can't, boy. And they go town by town where these towns have like 500 people. And the vote is 5,500 to 200 because the 5,000 Missourians are voting in Kansas for to make it a slave state. Um, so that whole election is rigged. In, in New Orleans, they have a case of yellow fever. And it kills 20,000 people in New Orleans in 1853. So uh, there were 13,000 votes cast in the previous pandemic election for the whole city of New Orleans. In, in this election, with 20,000 dead, there were 10,500 more votes than the election before the pandemic when 20,000 people died. And so this was another incredible election that was stolen. And... In, in 1851, they, there's an election in D.C., a municipal election, 
where they bring in the gangs of New York to D.C. to run roughshod through the through the neighborhoods. Again, the plug uglies, the Hudson dusters, the the dead rabbits are hired. The dead rabbits, my favorite, because they have the rabbit on the spike. That's their symbol. Oh, and great. The Hudson <laughs> dusters, the Hudson dusters would uh, beat up a cop, knock him unconscious and steal their duster, the long coat of the New York City cops. And they would wear that as a badge of honor, kind of like stealing a cop's hat. That's great. And they were on Hudson uh, Street down in New York. So they were the Hudson Dusters. They all have uh, uh, the Gophers, the Bowery Boys, obviously, obviously, obviously operated on the Bowery. But the, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. So the Bowery Boys go down there to D.C. and um, are hired out and begin to pillage, rape, kill. I think about... Um, uh, 12 were killed, there's like dozens were injured. They had to bring in, finally, the mayor of D.C. writes a letter to Buchanan, I think, who was president at the time, and he says, we need the U.S. Marines, Eric. So the U.S. Marines are called out by the president of the United States to be put into the street of Washington, D.C., um, to battle with the gangs of New York. This should be a separate movie. And the, and the pug uglies, the plug uglies get an, an artillery cannon <laughs> and they've got it on the middle of Washington, D.C. And they're about to go to war with the Marines, where the Marine commandant, who's in civilian clothes, walks through the battlefield and finds the head plug ugly and and talks him out of it. And they surrender to the U.S. Marines and on, they're not arrested. And the guy, the head plug ugly said, um, we could fight the police. We can't fight the U.S. Marines. And they go back to New York. But that election is stolen. Um, <laughs> yeah, the guy was right. It was it was Clay, by the way, not Tilden with Pope. Okay. Yeah, the guy was right. It's my, my, my misspoken. Um, so anyway, so 1866, the, the, in this particular thing here, there's in, in New Orleans, 1868, there's riots in the post-construction era of the Civil War, the blacks have the right to vote, as you're well aware. Well, in, there's thousands of blacks are killed, not because they're black, because they're voting Republican throughout Louisiana. It's not even a, a you know a, a black white thing. The blacks are voting for Republican candidates. They're lynched, killed uh, by the Democrats in Louisiana. I mean, thousand. I think over a thousand blacks were killed in the 1868 post-construction election. Um, and this will eventually end up with the repeal of Reconstruction at some point because of the 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 uh, uh, situation that is just so violent down there. But anyway, to, to be hired, uh, they hired like 200 um, gang members from Philly to come into New York. So they would come from out of state. Hmm. $22 a day, Eric. In That's 18, good money back then. I don't know. This was 1838. That's 20, like two months wages. Dude, that's an insane amount of money. Yeah, I mean, I think my dad in like 1960 something got a like $50 a month in the Marines for a salary. To, wow. And that's 1960. So, I mean, that, that's a lot of money back then. Wow. Wow. Anyway, so you see the fabric of this... Um, history of U.S. elections. This is our history. You know, after we get out of the colonial period with the liquor and the drinking, the liquor is then weaponized as a tool to um, take them down. At first, it's a jovial come on uh, by the colonial, uh, as I explained, the reason behind it. But later on, it's weaponized. And not only they are they are drugged and um, also plied with liquor. A lot of them are drugged. And some historians believe that in Baltimore, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was killed in a cooping incident where he was drugged and liquored up and left to die on the streets of Baltimore. Uh, that's never been confirmed, but there's always been urban legend that that's how Edgar Allan Poe died, which is kind of interesting. He died on Election Day. So, I mean, that's that's where it came from. And he, it was from drugs and alcohol, like an overdose. Um, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd heard that it was alcohol poisoning. He was allergic to alcohol or something. Right, or... right. There's something to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So let's, let's, let's move up to modern times, more modern times, like, uh, Let's say 1948. <laughs> let's, let's, let's move up to that time and see what's going on in the great state of Texas. Because Texas was a one-party state. Um, we're going to get to that. I don't know who that big guy is, but that was the guy that LBJ would talk to on the phone. But there was a guy named George Parr, and George Parr was the Duke of Duval County. Now, why was he the Duke of Duval County? because his father was the Duke of Duval County before him. And George Parr controlled Duval County and uh, um, the county right next door, which was um, right out of Alice, Texas, Jim Wells County. He controlled these two counties for votes. And when LBJ was running in 1948, there was a primary. Uh, keep in mind, this is a purely Democratic race because of the imbalance of the... Um, the parties in Texas, he ran against the governor, uh, originally ran against the governor of Texas, who was Pappy O'Daniel. Uh, Pappy O'Daniel was the governor. Um, uh, he ran for Senate seats in, 1940, in 1941, if we can go back a second to Pappy O'Daniel. Pappy O'Daniel was a singing governor, singing, drinking governor, uh, to my, as my Texas friends will tell me. Um, who's depicted here actually by Charles Durning in uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, that's Pappy O'Daniel in the movie. But the real Pappy O'Daniel toured with the Light Crust Doughboys. The Light Crust Doughboys, he would show up with a band in back of him, which, which I recommend. If you're going to run if you're gonna run for office, get a band to back you up and be part of the band. That would be the most effective method of campaigning ever. So Pappy O'Daniel would sing with the, with the band. And he would come out, and the band would play the Light Crust Doughboys, and they do radio spots. And you say, well, who are the Light Crust Doughboys? The Light Crust Doughboys eventually became Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. Uh, hmm. People in Texas know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, down there. So the Light Crust Doughboys, who did a ton of radio spots, became Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. And Pappy would tour with them as a the backup band and sing periodically in between speeches and drinking or whatever the hell was going on. So Pappy O'Daniel stole the 1941 election from LBJ. And why did why did he steal it and how did he steal it? LBJ was a novice with a guy named John Connolly, who was his crooked campaign manager, had the stupidity to declare how many votes he had, the final vote tally. And mm. Happy O'Daniel said, thank you very much, boy. And he trumped him, <laughs> to use a phrase, a more. <laughs> by a thousand votes and won the election. And LBJ said, Dad, never, that's never going to happen to me again. I'm going to do it to the next guy. So the next guy happens to be, there's LBJ, who got skunked in 1941, completely embittered, had a victory party. He had congratulatory, uh, congratulatory telegrams from everyone, drank and partied, got women, went crazy, celebrating his victory. And they went, hold on, boys. <laughs> there's some more votes coming in. And all of a sudden, Pappy O'Daniel, who knew how the state ran, uh, outdid him by a couple of thousand votes, and <laughs> LBJ was embittered. And him and Connolly didn't contest it; did not contest it. Uh, they did originally, initially made some uh, some beef, but they didn't go crazy. And he said, "We'll get him next time." Now, next time happens to be a guy named Coke Stevenson, who was a straight shooter. This guy here, who was lieutenant governor and then governor, was the straightest guy in the state of Texas. Uh, the a cowboy rode a white horse, wore a white hat was not a fake, was the real face of Texas. And this guy ran in this primary twice. It was a primary. He beat LBJ. Then there was a runoff because it was so close. They had a runoff in August of uh, 1948. So in that runoff, he's ahead and goes to bed. And when he wakes up, he's still ahead. But it begins to dwindle, Eric. And it takes a week. It takes a week. For this particular Senate race of 1948 out of the great state of Texas to resolve itself. And uh, what happens is, like I was trying to tell you, down in Jim Wells County, ne next door to Duval County, uh, George Parr, who is the, <laughs> the Duke of Duval County, goes to work. And he goes to work with a guy 
named the Indian, a.k.a. Indio, 275-pound Mexican, the guy on the left who's the enforcer. That guy is the Indian, also known as Indio. And they would beat the living crap out of everyone and were told to always produce the complete county vote for the candidate that has um, strong-armed them or indicated, you know, who's going to pay them. And this election begins to unravel. And they try to go to court. Coke Stevenson is fighting it. And Coke Stevenson says, I don't know what's going on down there. But all of a sudden, out in that box turns out to be 200 additional votes for LBJ, giving him the election. 202 votes totally in that precinct box, which disappears, but it's going to come up. Yeah, and that's 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 a guy, the Duke of Duval County. <laughs> there he is, George Parr. He controlled that county with an iron fist, and I mean an iron fist. This was not a fun place to live. It was mostly Mexicans and and really impoverished down there in South Texas and People in Texas probably know more about it than I do, but um, George Parr was one of those guys who ran those counties with an iron fist. And he produced 202 additional votes, 200 for LBJ, uh, two for Stevenson. So Coke Stevenson is so enraged that he says, first of all, he's suing, right? Just like Fetterman. But <laughs> He's suing and he goes down there with a guy named Frank Hamer. And you say, well, who's Frank Hamer? Why would he go with a guy named Frank Hamer? Well, Frank Hamer was his hunting partner, and he goes down to Alice, Texas, and him and Frank Hamer are literally, uh, there's Coke Stevenson, the third from the left, sitting down the black suit, white hair. That guy right there, that's, uh, yeah, that's Coke Stevenson. This is one of the hearings by the Democratic Party over the LBJ election um, with Coke Stevenson, 1948. So Coke Stevenson goes down with a guy named Frank Hamer, and they literally walk down the middle of the street in Alice, Texas, with guns exposed, with sidearms exposed on their on their hips. They are mm. met. They are met by five pistol arrows, led by Indio and the men of George Parr, in a in a right in the middle of town, Eric. In 1948, there is going to be a Wild West shootout in the middle of Alice, Texas. You can't make this up. In broad daylight, they are down there to find that box that you showed in that picture. That's why he's down there, is to find that box. And where's the box? Box is in a bank vault. Where's the bank vault? Alice, Texas. Right on that street. Those five pistol arrows are there to stop them from getting into that vault to see those ballots. Okay. You with me so far? Wow. <laughs> okay. But he's got Frank Hamer with him. You say, who the hell's Frank Hamer? Frank Hamer was the legendary Texas Ranger who killed Bonnie and Clyde in, a, in their death at the ambush of Bonnie and Clyde. That's who Frank Hamer was, the retired Texas Ranger and best friend of Coke Stevenson. The two of them went down there loaded for bear, and they were going to get answers. They went into that bank vault, and the bank president says, no way you're seeing those ballots. And they said, yes, we are. And they opened, they forced him at gunpoint to open that vault. In that vault was that box. And in that box was the list of the ballots, uh, the, the list of voters. And on that list was the full voting uh, registration and with the names, the signatures. And on the bottom of it were 200, and, 200 in a row, in alphabetical order, written in different ink, added on <laughs> with, with the same signature by the same guy, 200, 200 names, right? So they wrote, they began to write down the names, Hamer and him. The bank president said, screw you, puts the thing back in the vault, but they already had the names. They then went around the town to find the names. And all of them said, we voted for Coke Stevenson. And they said, who are you? He goes, I'm Coke Stevenson. You know, they kind of knew him because he was the governor, but you know, that's who they voted for. So here was an example, red-handed, of the fraud that LBJ had created to become, they, they go to court, that he goes and finds uh, uh, Douglas, the Supreme Court justice. Coke Stevenson goes to Douglas's house and says, I want this uh, uh, overturned. Douglas has some of his own criminal uh, uh, chicanery problems. So he, he doesn't want to get involved. I guess it was either too late or latches or something. So the Supreme Court doesn't help him. There's old Pappy. And um, it's, it, it's granted 
that LBJ is the winner of this 1948 election by how many votes, Eric? 87 votes. The 87 votes gives him the nickname of Landslide Linden. That's where it comes from. And he goes to Washington as Landslide Linden, and everybody mocks him as Landslide Linden because he used to be bullshitting Linden when he was in college, but now he becomes Landslide Linden. <laughs> is that an upgrade? <laughs> I don't know if it's an upgrade, but he was called Bull, Bull Linden before that. So wow. he'd already, he was obviously a congressman before that. So in 1945, um, uh, three years before this race, when he is a congressman, F FDR passes away. And at the funeral, he meets another congresswoman who's just weeping. She's a really innocent, ideologue, FDR, extreme lefty congresswoman named Helen Gehagen Douglas. And you say, oh. who is it? We covered her in the LBJ episode. Yeah. Some of the regular people might remember Helen Gehagen Douglas. Helen Gehagen Douglas was a movie star, a Broadway star, an opera singer, uh, absolutely stunning. Here she is in, in, in She, uh, which was a science fiction thing, uh, but a stunning actress who becomes a congresswoman in the 30th district right now. It wasn't the 30th back then, but the district I'm in now that's run by Adam Schiff. So here she is before she becomes a congresswoman in She. So She, it's a supernatural thing with, with all kinds of uh, uh, special effects and everything. I highly recommend it. Um, beautiful woman. She's married to Melvin Douglas, one of the most famous actors in Hollywood. Uh, Melvin Douglas and her, uh, they have the two of them together. Yeah, Melvin Douglas, one of the big Hollywood stars for many years. So she's married to uh, Melvin Douglas. So she wants to be a congresswoman. So she runs a Congress and, and she goes there in 1945. LB, LBJ is uh, at the funeral and, and the funeral. When I say the funeral, I mean the casket of uh, FDR in the rotunda. And she's weeping openly. And LBJ consoles her by <laughs> taking her into one of his many lairs scattered around the Capitol uh, in the uh, in the Capitol building and has sex with her for hours in that room. Um, with Helen Gehagen Douglas. They then become an item where they walk hand in hand. He sleeps over a house every night in Washington, DC, literally holding hands as they walk through the Capitol building, cited numerous times by people visiting the Capitol, <laughs> going, look, it's LBJ with Helen Gehagen Douglas. Isn't she married? They could care less. I mean, this affair is so wide open uh, and brazen that it's just strange how long it lasted. But the point of the matter is Helen Gehagen Douglas decides to run for the Senate of California. She's already a congresswoman in the 30th, which is now run by Adam Schiff, who, as I said the other day, is running against a tranny named Maybe a Girl. So Maybe a Girl, we showed a clip of the debate last week between Maybe a Girl and Adam Schiff. I, there's nobody else on the ballot. Maybe a Girl's a Democrat and Schiff's a Democrat. So I voted for maybe a girl. So I just want to get that out there. I voted for a progressive anti-war tranny over Adam Schiff. These are the choices I have here, folks. <laughs> but back then, the, the choice for Senate was uh, uh, Helen Gehagen Douglas, right, whose granddaughter, by the way, is Ileana Douglas, who had an affair with Martin Scorsese, who directed right. Gangs in New York which is if it goes full circle, there we go. There we go. Now we're really connecting some dots here, Hanley. <laughs> so yeah, you got to love her. She has an affair with Martin Scorsese and then gets uh, multiple parts out of him. Scorsese will eventually direct uh, Gangs of New York. But that being said, Helen Gehagen Douglas runs for Senate against a guy who's another congressman. And this race is the one we're going to cover now. And the guy she runs against is an obscure guy named Richard Milhouse Nixon. And here he is as a congressman um, running against Helen Gehagen Douglas. Now, this is an interesting race because Nixon haters cite this race as showing, he, he, first of all, he gets the nickname from her as Tricky Dicky. And mm. he names her the Pink Lady. So the Pink Lady, who is a commie leaning leftist, Helen Gehagen Douglas, gets taken to task in this election by Nixon for being a communist. And she can't defend herself because ostensibly she is. And <laughs> it's almost like Karen Bass. Um, 
right today running for for uh, this mayor's race here in L.A. Helen Gahagan Douglas was the extreme progressive wing of the Democratic Party in California. Here's a North Beach protest rally she has. She, she This chick did not miss a protest ever. Okay, so she's part of the Hollywood elite back then. She's got uh, Hollywood support, but so does Nixon. Nixon has Cecil B. DeMille. Nixon has um, uh, Ronald Reagan. Nixon has um, um, uh, John Wayne. And she thinks she has Ronald Reagan, but Nancy Davis takes Ronald Reagan to a Nixon rally and he switches sides. Ronald, here's a Nixon rally. He drove around with this uh, uh, station wagon. So Helen Gahagan Douglas is advised by her paramour, LBJ, to get herself a whirly bird, because that's what I got. I got <laughs> and he she gets a helicopter just like Johnson did in Texas. And they start calling her Helicopter after the, <laughs> the the helicopter. So she flies around California. She debates Nixon and loses badly in the debate. Nixon makes faces behind her back. She gets so rattled because she's she's an amateur, Eric, and Nixon's a, a, a smooth pro. And he doesn't really do anything nefarious in the entire race. He does nothing. The thing that he's cited for doing, and he, there's no dirty tricks. There's no dirty tricks at all. It's just they can't accept losing. He beats her by over 20 points because the Democrats flood and flee from her, conservative Democrats, and vote for Nixon. That's where this button came from. Democrats. You see this button, Eric? Democrats. Mm. That's oh. where this originally came from. Okay. The 1950 race in California, here, because the Democratic Party was at war with itself between the conservatives and moderate Democrats and the progressive communist wing. And an event happens that seals the fate of Ellen Gahagan Douglas. And that event is the Korean War. Ooh. And she's stuck outside in the rain naked like a donkey in a Texas hailstorm. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and she can't make it stop, to quote LBJ. And Truman, who is the party leader, has to own this Ukrainian-style war that the American people strongly hate. And I'm beginning to believe that Biden is not, is not Jimmy Carter. He is Truman. And I'll tell you why. Truman, in a lot of ways, was an old, angry man. He came from a thoroughly corrupt Pendergast machine. He was riddled himself with corruption, just like Joe Biden. He had a very unpopular war, Ukraine and the Korean War, just like Joe Biden. Both of the, uh, uh, he was a, a big anti-Semite, Truman, as was his wife, and the anti-Semitism in the Biden administration is, is running rampant. And I believe that Joe Biden is really Harry Truman, except Truman had the buck stops here. And with Biden, it's the schmuck stops here. <laughs> take that. That's free. I just made that. The word of the day. <laughs> that's, the that's the bumper sticker of the day. You can use that. But anyway, getting back to Douglas, Truman refuses to endorse Douglas because everyone's afraid of getting tainted or painted with a red brush. So they go, yeah, here is the pink sheet. This is just her record. But by accident, Murray Chotner, who was, Tr who, was, who was Nixon's lawyer and campaign manager, he was the former campaign manager for the governor of California, a governor with an obscure record named Earl Warren, who will later head the Warren Committee. Mm. So he goes and prints up her record at the printer. They go to the printer, they just order it. And by accident, they choose pink paper. Having oh. nothing to do it right, it was an accident. Of course. So, this 50,000 run press thing of the pink paper uh, takes off. It becomes like a cause celeb. So they run 500,000 pink copies of her record. And these this becomes the pink sheets uh, of Helen Gahagan Douglas. None of that stuff in there is wrong. He, did, he doesn't uh, say any lies about Helen Gahagan Douglas. He, she just can't defend her own record as a communist. She loses by a landslide. This is not a close race. It was not a contested race. It was not a race that has fraud. The Democrats came over. This is a state that was 60% uh, 
Democrat registered voters and 35 percent registered uh, Republican. The reverse is the victory for Nixon. 60 percent for Nixon, 35, 40 percent for her. I think she got about 40. He got about 60. It was a clear 20 plus point uh, um, decision on the part of Richard Nixon versus versus Helen Hagen Douglas. Again, clean election. Nobody ever contested it, but they used it against Nixon. All of these lies started on Nixon back here with this original lie about him painting her with a red brush and making up stories about Helen Gahagan Douglas. All of them were true. Hmm. Fascinating. And I'm guessing his landslide is what propelled him into being VP later. Yes. He only serves two yeah. years. And because of California, right. Because of that landslide and democratic support, he's got democratic support uh, up and down in the Senate. I mean, people, you know, this guy was not controversial. He was considered uh, in the moment to be this anti-communist. He wasn't, you know, like McCarthy or anything. It, it, people did not feel comfortable with commies any longer that we were at war with communist China. That's what, what, what sealed her fate and sealed the fate of the Democratic Party in 1952. Because there's eight years from 52 to 1960 where it may have been the most tranquil years in American history in term, you know, during the, the, the Eisenhower administration, if you think about it, because that period of time um, was a period of Eisenhower and Nixon together running the country. And, you know, 1960 comes. Oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. There's a guy who walks into his office, uh, Nixon Senate office during the Hagan campaign. Right. And the guy gives him a check. It was another uh, senator. Gives him a, a campaign donation for fifteen thousand dollars, a check, personal check, and he looks at the check and he says, "Thank you very much." And he looks up, and the guy giving him the check is JFK. Whoa! And it's made <laughs> out by Joseph Kennedy, and on the note wow. it says, "I don't want Gahagan and her communist beliefs in the House of Representatives or the Senate any longer." And Nixon said, thank you very much to JFK, who said, here's a gift from my dad. I mean, just to show you the camaraderie that, that there was no right. bad will. This was just his father, Joseph Kennedy, made that donation to Nixon. Um, and then what happens? He, he will run against Nixon, and obviously, in 1960. Um, well, just to briefly get into that race, because Robert Kennedy Jr. explained this to me, the all of this stuff about um, uh, uh, Kennedy stealing the election in Illinois and Chicago, you know, with the help of the mob, what Bobby pointed out, Bobby Jr. pointed out was even if you take Illinois off the board and give it, you take Illinois off the board and, and, and give it to Nixon, right? You just take it as the entire state. You just go, okay, he doesn't win Illinois. JFK still wins by the electoral college vote. And I didn't realize that until Bobby Jr. explained it to me. Hmm. Illinois does not change the election. So stealing of Chicago does not change the election. So the mob stealing it for, for Kennedy does not change the election. All of that is what we say in Yiddish is bubamysis, which means lies. And so, well, ironically, that would mean that he wouldn't feel beholden to him. That's right. That's right. So That's it right. could have happened. I know, but it doesn't I, I know, matter. But it, it didn't matter. But no, I'm saying, but that makes right. more sense that it's irrelevant. It's, irrelevant. it's it's one of these lies in, in history, again, that is not true. He would have won the election anyway, because the, he had enough electoral votes to win the election. And I mean, I, I'll give the breakdown on locals. I could show I'll show you the numbers on locals uh, for mm. our people there. And I'll list all the books that I've been using for this this particular show. But the, the reality of it is. The the there's a lot of misnomer out there. There's a lot of, of of urban lies that are out there about history. And if you control the internet and are able to scrub things like election fraud and history, uh, you can control a lot of minds. I mean, this it, it's you know, it, it's it's really interesting. The only place you ever find any truth is, and even that's um, sketchy, is in books. When what I do for this research is, like I've, I've explained to you, I will compare notes of numerous books and then see what the majority and the references are usually from memoirs the best i mean you could read i've read the gahagan memoirs i've read nixon's memoirs so you begin to see 
Uh, like, in other words, in Gahagan's memoir, she didn't realize that Reagan abandoned her and went for Nixon. But in Nixon's memoirs, he explains that Nancy Davis took Reagan to his rally and that they embraced him and then talked to others mm -hmm. in Hollywood. She didn't know that. She just didn't know that. And it's not in her memoir. So you, it's just a minor example of, of cross-referencing uh, biographies and memoirs. Biography is a little bit shakier because you can get guys like this Michael Beschlos who's lost his mind, uh, who's now the official historian for Biden. He's written a bunch of books about LBJ and presidential elections that you have to look at suspect, which I always did, you know, but the reality of it is you can't trust all of them. You need a lot of them. You need to look at the Robert Caro books on, on LBJ, but you also have to look at, at uh, um, the book, you know, Mastermind of the Assassination, um, those kind of books also, and, and mm -hmm. see the, the dark side, because they try repeatedly not to let these books be published, and they do that for a reason. There's a reason that they battle and have CIA influence in America's publishing houses even to this day, because books are permanent. Internet mm -hmm. can be scrubbed. Books are permanent, friends. And and let that be the word of the day in terms of books, because uh, unless that's that's why they burned them in Fahrenheit 451. Yep. And everybody go to locals because I, I will want to check out the electoral counts and everything else, too. I mean, that's I, yeah. I never heard that before. And yes, Brian Press, we're seeing that you highly, highly doubt this. And so I hope you're on locals and check it out. Highly doubt this. OK, I'll give you the numbers on locals, bro. Well, you'll see. <laughs> so, you can I mean, argue yeah. all night with your family about it. But, you know, the um, that's the facts. I didn't realize it either until until Bobby Kennedy explained it to me. But. Yeah, I mean, look, you can argue all day about popular vote and, 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 and electoral college and everything else. You know, people always say, why is it on Tuesday, you know, the election day? And, and there really is no, no sane reason as to why it's on Tuesday. When I researched why it's on Tuesday for election day, as many people know, in Europe and other places, it's on the weekend because you're off from work. So here, they didn't want it on Sunday for religious reasons. They didn't mm -hmm. want it on Saturday for religious reasons. They didn't want it on Friday for religious reasons. And Tuesday was selected because you, uh, you needed all Monday to travel to go to the voting booth. Okay. So that, that's the logic behind it. Why is it the first Tuesday after the first Monday? Because November 1st was All Saints Day. And they didn't mm. want it to be the, the Tuesday after that. So that, that was another piece of reason. November itself was chosen for agrarian reasons, you know, for, for farming. Harvest is pretty much. It's, right. Um, so there's always yeah. been this discussion as to possibly making it a national holiday, but there's been no groundswell for that. And there's been no groundswell mm. of a lot of people pushing politicians. Politicians don't care. They want it on the worst day possible. So the lowest turnout is what benefits them. You know what I mean? So the, 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 there is no movement or demand to move it off of that Tuesday crazy day, which no other country on earth has, to, uh, <laughs> to make it on the weekend. You know, and maybe people don't want it on the weekend. Maybe they don't care. Maybe it's apathy. But nobody's pushing it, and it doesn't look like it's ever going to change. And now it's become weak, you know, uh, months of voting. So, <laughs> All right. So uh, speaking of voting... Um, we've got some super chats coming in and I know we want to definitely finish up because we're going to run into Viva and Barnes. At seven, yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to collide with them or overlap. When worlds <laughs> collide. That's right. That's right. So, um, Tarkina Meyer, any rumors on Soros now funding judges? You were just yeah, talking about that earlier. At the small, yeah. uh, the, when we started, what is that? What four, about pages four pages of Democratic unopposed judges. Okay, they're not unopposed. There's four judges in the ballot in L.A. that were opposed, but they were secretly hiding there, and we kind of outed them. So hopefully they'll be defeated. Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, here's a few bucks before YouTube burns down our channel. Uh, yeah. No, this is really appreciated. I can tell you that uh, we went yellow a long time ago, and I'm not even going to ask. I am not even going to ask for. Right. Uh, Why not? You can, it doesn't hurt to ask. My mother always told me that. Yeah, it does hurt to ask because it, it draws second not. attention. Come on, watch Look. this video disappear and only be on Rumble. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Sometimes you don't uh, you don't poke the bear. Um, too, too, too many too many words are thrown around. 
If you get demonetized for language or topics, what happens to Super Chat money? It's sent for to a small country in Africa, and there it's spent by CIA. <laughs> actually, we do get the Super Chat money minus YouTube's cut. That actually will flow through no matter what. I mean, unless a whole channel gets nuked, then I don't know how that's going to shake out. Add to Jay's thing that shall not be named. Who's Jay? Um, it was somebody else in the chat. I, uh -oh. I didn't um, catch that at the time. But um, Pasha is on break. Um, Democrats media have repeated uh, ad nauseum. It's a dog Demi whistle. It's a dog yeah. whistle. Yeah. They don't mean this, Pasha. It's a dog whistle, bro. The opposite way of how they wanted it to sound. Now, it's a dog whistle. By the way, I hate the term dog whistle because it seems like they're the only ones who hear it. Uh, <laughs> you know? um, yeah, this is right when you're in the middle of the black pilling moment when you're just telling us how everything was going to fall apart. Etienne was saying how much she loves you. Not many reasons to be optimistic. I refuse. I'm going to live in a Pollyanna moment and, okay. and will mark to be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. That's I believe me. I wish I'm wrong. I'm not betting on it. Um, thanks to work. Yeah, yellow fever. Yeah, the, the, yeah. yeah. that's New Orleans, man. That's New, well, Orleans. that's New Orleans. And it also was when I said that we went yellow. Oh, oh yellow fever. I get it. That's <laughs> funny. That was funny. Um, and then a theory. this is, I said uh, that, didn't I? Yeah, this is way before you said it. Oh, I've been oh, collecting oh. these because of the flow. Oh, so yeah, the chat had mentioned it before you came up. Oh, thanks, uh, for, kicking, thanks for kicking the shovel out of my hand at work here today. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you. I, there's no money involved. I can't even tell a story without these people wikipedia the shit out of my storylines. <laughs> thank you. I was helping. Uh, super sticker. Thank you from Peter. Right. I'm a quarter glass. Yeah, I guy. am. I, Tony, I am. I really am, just from experience. And then when the glass is full, I celebrate. But, yeah, I'm a, I'm a third uh, glass full guy. And John Yarber saying that Nixon was skull oh, and bones. Yeah. My mother was skull and bones. She took a skull, made a soup bowl out of it, and put chicken bones in it. Everybody's skull and bones. You know, um, there's a theory on that, that that's – that skull and bones that they have a cup and that's actually Blackbeard's skull. Right. For, Nobody hated you know. Yaley's and the Eastern elite more than Nixon, by the way. Uh, he was not part of that crowd. He was not part of the Bush crowd. He was not part of the Yale crowd. He was not part of the skull and bones crowd. Please consider, um, if I could find it, I'll unblock you. I go, sure. Absolutely. No problem. <laughs> I'll, I'll go uh, look for it. Uh, Linda Walker. What's the girl's name? Linda Walker. Uh, just so I can scroll through the thousands of block people, uh, I mean they intend to destroy democracy. I, again, I, it's it's um, just a semantic. L yeah, discussion. Linda, oh, I, Linda uh, Wel Walker. Welker. Okay, I'll get I'll get on it. It's it's just a semantical discussion, Pasha, because I believe what they're doing is signaling for this particular election uh, to their minions down below, and I think that's what this whole thing has been about. The they later followed it up. Uh, saying that the count is going to be long and all this other stuff is happening. It's all part of a plan um, for this particular, and also 2024. The four pages of unopposed was Dallas County. Oh, that oh okay, okay. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Well, and there you go, Turquino. There's a conference in Dallas coming up. Oh, yeah, moment. that's why we got that video, Eric. What happened to our video? Oh, we got it. The da Let's show the Dallas video. All right, hang on. We're going to – look, if anybody wants to meet up, we're going to do some – if we get a group of people, I'm going to do a walkthrough through Dealey Plaza uh, once and the next day for two days with Eric. We're going to walk through uh, – if we get a group, I mean, I'll gladly walk you through the uh, Dealey Plaza crime site. If uh, we're, we're at the Crown Plaza, by the way, don't storm the Bastille, but <laughs> – we, we are where the conference is, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're at the conference we're... is, so, yeah, I'm staying at a secret other location. Hundreds so, of the crowd the, the, okay. but, but if we if we do get a meetup, um, let us know. We're happy to walk you through the assassination. All right, and uh, take notes now.
And that, oh, that by the way, good. that looks that's very, next very week. Exciting! It's coming up pretty quick, folks. Yeah, we're driving uh, the twenty uh, second. Uh, it'll be the 59th anniversary of the assassination. Next year is the sixtieth. Hunley and I will return for the sixtieth, uh, which will be even bigger. Free food, party, free bullets, shoot 'em ups, the whole thing. It's going to be a wild extravaganza this year too. Um, so if anybody's down in Dallas or wants to come through locals or a former group or go down there, uh, we can make, uh, have some fun with it and, uh, meet up. And I do plan to try to live stream us while we're Oh, there. right. Yeah. We're going to do some, so. we're going to do some live stuff. Yeah. We're going to do some live stuff. Um, yeah. that'll be fun. Um, Mark, are we in violent? I don't know about violent, but we're in agreement. I don't know about that. <laughs> violent agreement. Uh, I love that phrase. I, I love that Mark, phrase. I found an old arc about how Nixon Kennedy, there was separate slate of unsigned Hawaii to be counted. None of that mattered, you know, because of the um, the overwhelming electoral college victory. So it didn't, none of that came to play. But that is true. That is true. Uh, but it wasn't relevant because he had 302. All right. Well, on the theme of, um, of Dallas, we uh, always have merch with Oswald, the Patsy. I probably oh, we won't should bring, bring him with us. We, what can you get him a ticket on the plane, or does he go, he go in your luggage? I can maybe fit him in the luggage. Okay. Oswald, did, Oswald never learned how to drive, sadly. Ruth Payne <laughs> took him for driving lessons one time, and it, he had problems parallel parking with Ruth Payne. Why what? she had to, I you guess can't see wanted, over the steering wheel, dude. What do you want? She 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 was determined to teach Lee Harvey Oswald how to drive. <laughs> oh god. Weird. What a strange, strange mix. That's a strange relationship. Speaking of which, he'll be there, the director, uh, Max. Oh, Max Good will be there. Yeah, we could meet him, too. He's going to screen his uh, Ruth Payne documentary. Jim DiEugenio will be there screening Destiny Betrayed, which I strongly recommend. The four-hour version, forget about JFK Revisited, which they cut for Showtime, uh, just to put it on Showtime. But the four-hour version, which is on, you can buy it, which I strongly recommend. I think it's about $25. Uh, but it's on Amazon, too, in four sliced up episodes an hour each. It'll explain so much to you about the assassination. You will never listen to Ben Shapiro ever again in terms of his analysis of the JFK assassination. Boy, Ben Shapiro has been wrong on so many historic issues that, um, and apologize. I'm, I'm wondering when he's going to reach out and apologize on the JFK assassination. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I mean, he hasn't really apologized on um, the his war? latest. He, the, the Persian Gulf. Did he ever apologize for the war or no? No, not really. Okay. I, I don't think he, he apologizes a whole lot. He'll say that they lied to us, like you said recently. Oh, right, right. That was his But thing. that wasn't exactly Her like apology. saying. Apology, right, right. I mean, which is whatever. I'm not you know trying to necessarily yeah. get him to do it, but yeah. Oh, hey, we got a, um, a rumble rant from uh, Krabby T. Girth. Oh, it's one of the great rumble runs. Crabby. I think so. Twenty uh, percent of the machines in Arizona are not working. Deliver the vote, Tracy Campbell. Highly recommended. Um, how many percent in Arizona? Twenty percent. Who's the Secretary of State? Uh, somebody you know, Katie Hobbs. <laughs> it, it, it as Lenny Bruce said about Chicago in 1958. It's so corrupt. It's thrilling. And he was being sarcastic, but that's where we are, folks. The brazenness that is going to happen today is going to be that crazy, in my humble opinion. I hope I'm wrong. Please let me be wrong. Yes, please. Please. I beg myself to be wrong. I mean, we don't have the Duke of Duval County anymore, but we've got other sy systems in place. These machines have to go, like Trump keeps saying, one day, paper ballot, that's it. One day, paper ballot, that's it. That's it. Um, Every he, other country does it. That's it. This whole thing started to go haywire with the machines and the uh, mail-in ballots. Those are the two. That was what they. That was the precinct box thirteen of today. That's the. That's they keep upping their their game, and it becomes like a three card Monty thing on the streets. Um, if you've ever seen three card Monty played in New York, it's a fascinating sleight of hand to watch. And I, I urge people to, if they're still playing three card Monty in New York, to watch the beauty of it and see how the game is played. It's fascinating. But never bet. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> no bet. I just like to watch as they do it because they, they have a spotter down the street. There's two phony guys. There's the dealer. 
there's two phony guys playing and then there's the the victim and up the street a little bit there's a lookout and the lookout just i don't know why i'm getting into this but um the lookout if they see the cops coming would yell slide them up so every time i was coming home from work when I worked for my uncle on 42nd Street, and I'd see a three-card Monty game. I'd yell, slide them up, and they collapse the cardboard and run. <laughs> it was a little fun, you know, uh, with the three-card Monty scammers because they were they were ripping people off, and it was, you know, they, were, they should have been arrested. But they had a cardboard box with a cardboard table and, you know, doing the, the cup thing. And, and, yeah, very, very folded card. They palmed the folded card and... Maybe we could do a three card Monty episode someday. Yeah, no, no that'd be cool. Well, have, of New Instead of gangs in New York, we'll do scams of New York. That'd be a, what? Uh, a 10 part series? <laughs> Probably could take forever. I know I had Spidey on and he was breaking down uh, how mechanics work cards. It was really fascinating. Oh, you mean magicians or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. both ma magicians and mechanics. Right. And he was flat out saying, the way you can always tell is how they handle the cards. Yeah. And if, yeah. if they hold the car a specific way, they're scamming you every right. time, as they put it. It's fascinating. But on that happy note, I'm sure folks will want to head over to Viva and Barnes for what, continuing what happens over election there? Should we coverage. go over there, too? What goes on there? I don't know. I don't know. We'll check it Where's out. Where's Barris? Does Barris have a show? I think we're running into Barris time right now. Okay, so he's got a show, and then there's another show with Barnes and Viva? At 7. What time's it now? Oh, it's coming to 4, my time. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. All right, what are you going to do? Um, probably whatever I'm told by the higher authority in my house. All right, well, I hope we packed in enough information. There's so much more. I'm sorry. I made. Uh, there might be some technical mistakes here, but there was a lot of information I wanted to get out today for election day. And I hope I'm wrong about those predictions. I hope we take the Senate plus four. I hope we take the house by uh, 265 and, uh, and make this guy a lame duck by tomorrow night. Perfect. And Barris and Barnes are on right now. Okay. I'm going to go. Check them. I'm All, right. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, well, well.